Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by Carium, the telehealth platform enabling healthcare's digital transformation, helping you care for people within the fabric of their daily lives. Now, here's your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Doug Duskin, Chief Executive Officer at Avil eCare. Doug, welcome to the show. Hi, Matt. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, to chat today. Yeah, so, Doug, what I always like to do before getting into the main part of the conversation is give my guests a little bit more of a chance to introduce who they are and what they do. So the floor is yours. Ah, great. Thank you. So you've introduced me as the Chief Executive Officer for Avil eCare. And Really excited to have this opportunity to speak with you, speak with uh, your listeners. As we contemplate healthcare in the ecosystem, which we're all living in today, and how we're delivering care, Evel is a telemedicine company that has its roots going back 20 plus years as part of a larger health system. The, the foundation of the organization was based upon being able to really deliver healthcare to every person in every community. Um, across the country and to ensure that that people received high quality care uh, and that we were able to facilitate that primarily in rural markets. Well, in the last year or two, as um, healthcare systems continue to experience need for cash and, and some of the COVID issues that were going on, uh, Avera McKenna, who owned Avel eCare, decided to sell the company. And, and, and really position it for a buyer to come in and take it and continue to grow on that mission while at the same time, Avera, allowing the brick and mortar health system to grow its needs. So um, I started in this role in November of 21. Actually, I started looking at the company back in March as Aqualine Capital Partners was positioning to buy the company. We closed that transaction in November and I became the CEO. And so it's really exciting to be here. Uh, You know, this continues to build upon my background in providing leadership in healthcare, whether it be in a group that's focused on government programs when I was at Change Healthcare, or whether it is really focused on providing communities of need or underserved communities like at Equality Health when I was there as president of the technology group for their health care. And I think Avell and telemedicine is allowing that to occur today. And that's why I'm excited to join the company. And, and really, as I look in my career, um, this is the type of opportunity that I've always tried to seek where an, an important aspect of our economy and our business needs meet with a mission that you believe in. And so, look, I can go on and on about that, but nevertheless, let's get into this because I'm excited to share with you and your listeners more about what we do and and how I think the healthcare ecosystem can only benefit by expansion of our service plan. No, I think that'll be great. And I definitely want to explore kind of, as you said, that rural delivery and increasing equality within healthcare. Uh, but kind of one more background question. I'm always interested to know what first got you into healthcare. Yeah, so that's a great question. I think my my a lot of my friends and family have asked me the same question because if you go to my beginning of my career, you know, I was an econ and an accounting, a double major in economics and accounting out of school, and and I jumped into public accounting, and I was with Price Waterhouse and then Price Waterhouse Coopers, and really focused on business combinations and transactions. So I always had this financial bet early in my career to what I did. And that kind of guided me through kind of a growth pattern where after I left public accounting, I joined private equity and I started to learn more about industry and what was going on and what was driving the economy and where gaps were. But everything became more financially oriented. So I joined a company after leaving private equity. And and finally, when we divested a couple of holdings and I was, I had this assessment in my career, I think this process where I said, okay, let me step back and not take what I can do. Let me look at where I think personally I'd be rewarded as well as where my skill set could benefit. And healthcare popped up. You know, I looked at it as this was in 2010. I looked at healthcare as probably one of the largest long-term, midterm and long-term 
driver of GDP in the economy in our in our country, as well as one of the industries that I think could use services of somebody focused on corporate transformation and really working through problems and using metrics to drive performance and drive leadership skills with our teams. And, and so to me, it was the first time I actually stopped looking for a job and looked for an industry or a career that I wanted to be in. Cause I think it would, um, I could benefit and I could benefit from it as well. And so that's kind of the process I went through to get into healthcare and, and it started really with uh, joining a company called Outcomes Health, which was a HEDIS and risk adjustment business working on government programs and, and filings with CMS and, and working with some of our Medicare, Medicaid, and, and then eventually the ACA programs within the country. Um, and it's continued to expand from there. It, so kind of that desire to tap into a mission how is that being fed now with with Avell, where you said you're focused on kind of rural telehealth and you know, expanding the reach of how you can better you know, help and serve patients? Yeah, no, absolutely. Great question. You know, as I look at even within healthcare, and I, I go back to my early days as I focused on government programs, um, my client was the, the insurance company, the payer. So it was large healthcare insurers across the country. Um, and, and as you serve one aspect of the market, uh, you start to see that there's this other part of the market that's that's missing and that to bring some kind of equilibrium between the two where everybody wins in a market ends up driving higher outcomes uh, for patients, which is what matters. And I think, you know, the the time at Outcomes, which became Altegra, which became Change Healthcare through multiple acquisitions, um, just really led me to the fact that I needed to, to sit somewhere between the payer or the insurance company and the provider so that I could try to facilitate or the company I was with could facilitate delivery of care and outcomes of that care. Um, I joined after I, after Change Healthcare went public, I left and I joined a company called Equality Health with the same, with a mission that provided a tool between the payer and the provider to align care. And, and you could definitely see the difference. And it, it went to this mission of, in the end, whatever we do in healthcare needs to improve the experience and the outcome of the healthcare delivered to a patient. If we're not doing that, then, then it's just a, an internal game, right? And that's kind of how my mind was working around it. So um, Equality Health is, a, is an MSO, and, and we ended up changing our strategy. We sold uh, our business to General Atlantic, and I decided to take that opportunity to either re- even further refine this mission seeking a kind of ex- exhibition, so to speak. And I found through mutual friends, Aqualine and, and Avera was selling a Val, and their mission really is at the heart of what I've been trying to achieve in healthcare, and that is how do we deliver the strongest, best outcomes to patients? And if you look at rural health facility, you know, facilities across the country, you know, they're plagued, I think, with, with multiple issues, whether it be just shortage of beds in general uh, in, the, in the hospitals and then facilities, whether it be, you know, the shortage of availability of clinicians, um, or even through the last two years in the COVID pandemic, just a higher number of intakes of sick patients that need care. Um, and, and as you wrap these three constant issues in a rural environment around one another, the, the lack of beds, the lack of doctors, and the increase in patients, the doctors or the clinicians that are present continue to feel burnout. They continue to work hours. They don't have the ability to separate uh, at the end of the day and, and refresh. They don't, you know, hospital systems don't have the flexibility to allow um, time off. It's it's just a really draining experience. And so I think this is where Avell comes in, and this is where that mission to provide outcomes really drives forward. And that is, you know, we can do that for them. We can insert technology into the facility at the bed and, and staff it with our clinicians throughout the country. So, so we can provide that respite for the local doctors. We can provide that expertise that may be missing in certain specialties. Um, we can keep ICU beds open. 
And when you start combining these thoughts and going, wait a minute, we can keep ICU beds open. We can keep doctors fresh and, and in staff. You start to see the direct impact on the patients in these rural markets. So that's why, I, you know, you go back to this mission and how mission is exciting. It is exciting. And I think we, we suit that really well. And, and in terms of being able to kind of tackle those issues, because you just listed off probably what's only the tip of the iceberg of a multitude Absolutely. of issues for the rural settings. You, how do you effectively deploy some of those technology solutions that you were referencing in the rural setting? So we have software, workflow software we've developed, or we have workflow software we've partnered with others to develop on our behalf. And, you know, it's it seems like it would be complex, but it's putting a high quality camera and sound system into each bed or by each bed. It's having the workflow software behind it that supports it. Those parts are the easy parts, right? To, to gain access into a facility. The difficult part is ensuring there's a high enough bandwidth connection so that there's no late, the latency issues don't um, sneak up and cause problems. Because as you can imagine, as you're diagnosing care, you don't need pixelation. You need you know, strong connectivity. And, and so that's really where the problem comes in. And, and I mean, we're working with USAC and the FCC to continue to drive high broadband access to facilities across the country. But that's really the, the problem we face. There, there's an issue, there's an instance, it's a, it's a good case study, I think, where in Montana, there was a, a client that it took almost a year, nine months to 12 months, nine to 12 months to get a broadband uh, capability, a wire, you know, a wired connectivity into the facility. And, and as you think about that, think about how upset you would be if you're sitting at home and, and you can't get internet into your house so you can stream Netflix. Well, this is on a much bigger, this is on a much grander scheme of importance. And, you know, these are some of the issues that the country faces. And, you know, I would say if you, if you poll people in a, in a large MSA, a large metro area, this isn't a thought that they've had. You know, nobody considers the fact that it's not easy to have connectivity uh, wherever you are, especially in the United States. I mean, you go to you go on vacation to islands and some other areas, you might expect some issues, but we still have an infrastructure challenge that that we're facing in this country. And I'm pointing out that disparity in infrastructure access is one that, as you said, many many people wouldn't necessarily have it come to the forefront of their mind because it's not something that they've had to experience. Um, and for those of you just joining, I'm talking with Doug Duskin from Avell eCare. We're talking about rural health and mission, the drive for a mission and in, in the work that you're doing. But I'd like to go back to that broadband and that infrastructure, you know, challenge that you were just talking about. I know you were talking about work that you're doing with some government agencies, but you're kind of can you paint like a little bit of a bigger picture for for the listeners to understand what is like actually being done to help improve that infrastructure issue? Because it, you know, I think you know maybe you've heard talk about you know different bills or spending initiatives from Congress, but you know what what is actually happening on the ground? Yeah, so there is organizations that nonprofit organizations that work with and beside the FCC to help offset the cost of wiring the country and ensuring there is connectivity through the country. And so one of them is um, USAC that is, is quite instrumental in helping drive cost reimbursement in some of these markets. So there is a recognition that um, broadband is not as well deployed as it needs to be. And I think Commissioner Carr has uh, is focused on expanding that, and with a lot of the funding, you know, we hope that it's still it's driven towards telemedicine. I mean, one of the things that that we see with the COVID uh, pandemic experience is that there's been more acceptance of telemedicine, and there's been a lot of um, setting aside the require certain requirements and utilizing cross-border licensing, you know, cross-state licensing to ensure that there's uh, clinicians available. So I think we're continuing as a country to learn. 
um, that, and I think it will continue. And my view is that it will continue to expand the reach of telemedicine. You know, sometimes when you have an experience like we've had the last two years, good ideas are vetted from it. And, and I think that the importance of telemedicine and the ability to provide care wherever and whenever is something that won't revert to levels that were being utilized prior to this. I think the it's seen as successful and, and seen as a way to allow rural health care, uh, and not just rural health care, I mean, you know, health care in general, to, to continue to service its patients the best way it can. So, so the government has a component of ensuring connectivity, the FCC component of it, and, and then it's from there, it's being able to continue to push and provide that level of service, and that falls on us as a delivery organization of healthcare. And certainly agree with you in terms of the benefit that is being derived from the expanded and enhanced utilization of telehealth. From your perspective, what do you think are some of the less obvious lessons that have been learned? Because I think you were just touching upon some of the ones that have generated a lot of discussion and, and a lot of focus. But I also suspect that you've seen other benefits or other lessons learned that maybe aren't receiving sufficient um, general coverage. So my view of or what I continue to hear, and it, whether it be from my staff or, or other members of healthcare SID delivery systems, you know, we've talked about the, the kind of big issues around rural health care. But I think there's also a set of issues that underlie all health care in the country. And, you know, as we continue to hear hospitals are over or, or don't have capacity. And, and then and everybody looks at the amount of people intakes related to COVID. I think what, what's being missed right now is the availability of clinicians. So it's not as, while there is an increase in, in intakes, what we're seeing also is that there are floors of hospitals that are closed currently. So there are beds that cannot be utilized in hospitals, whether it be in New York, whether it be in Atlanta, or whether it be in Billings, Montana. They're beds that can't be utilized because overall the in healthcare environment has a shortage of clinicians, primarily nurses, to man those beds and to take care of patients once they put them in there. So hospital systems are don't have enough people to to service the number of beds. So they close those floors because they can't access them. Um, and that it creates a worse problem as they have an increase in patients come in. So, so I think some of the things that are missed in this isn't just that COVID or the pandemic is driving an increase in intakes. While it is, the thing that's not being discussed is the number of clinicians available to man beds that are present has declined. And that's through burnout, retirements, or just general lack of numbers. And, and so that's more of a national issue that, that needs to be accounted for as we try to reshape how we deliver care. You know, it's one of the things that I view as an opportunity for, for the Avell and how we manage through telemedicine is our solution allows a clinician to still provide medical care, clinical care, which they're educated in, which they want to do. But it shifts the environment out of um, bedside in a hospital, which is extremely taxing, to be able to do and use that same knowledge and deliver it through um, the, the telepresence that we have in each of these rooms. So it shifts kind of the environment they're working in from a minute by minute perspective, which I think is healthy. And I think it shows that we can use telemedicine to continue to cover those beds continue to attract talent to so that there isn't a shortage overall uh, in, in the national healthcare ecosystem. You know, it, it kind of, as you just said, shifting how the, the care is delivered or how the interaction can occur, you know, is important because I think it's, you know, as you said, the, there are staffing shortages that, and I agree with you, it's you know, one of those instances where COVID is probably shining a brighter spotlight on an issue that has existed for a number of years now. It's not something that resulted solely from COVID. Well, well yes, you can probably say that the situation has 
been exacerbated because of it. You know, I think as you were also saying, it's, you know, a problem like that doesn't arise overnight. You know, so with that kind of that shift that you were talking about, does that also help with one of the other kind of storylines, which is you have people who have, you know, trainees, whether, you know, at probably at many different levels of clinicians where they get trained in metropolitan areas and it might be difficult to have them move to a rural area. You know, so does that shifting that you enable help address some of that concern as well? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, from a telemedicine perspective, in in there, if you look across the eight lines, kind of of service that we offer, all but maybe emergency room, and and that's simply something we're working on to facilitate a faster side by side link. Um, but all of our service lines is it's indifferent as to where that clinician sits. Um, we have what we call hubs or e-helms, where if you walk into our facility in Michigan or in Sioux Falls, it, it looks as if, you know, you've got monitors up and you have doctors and nurses manning them. And it's, it's almost like a hospital setting. However, it doesn't have to be that. And so as we look at expanding our own network, because that's something, if you look at our pillars that we have built our strategy around, one of them is network expansion which is growing the docs and the nurses and just the clinicians overall that work with us, I need to be indifferent as to where they are, right? Because if you live in Boston, you have family in Boston, you might not want to relocate to, to a rural city around the country, but you want to provide care there because you, you have a passion to ensure that those patients um, and those individuals in the community are receiving solid really strong quality of care. So we can facilitate that through an internet connection. And um, it, to me, that's an, an exciting opportunity for a clinician because they don't have to relocate to work with us. They can work from their home home office. And, um, and that's valuable. And, and kind of thinking about that, and also I think going back to a, a, a point or two that you made a little bit ago in terms of the, the environment and, you know, how enablement of telehealth changed because of, you know, regulatory relaxation or uh, other changes because of COVID. You were also talking about the, the company has 20 or so years of experience, so existing in both worlds. What changes do you feel would be beneficial to help further entrench and further advance telehealth as we at some point, maybe in 2022 or maybe a, a year or so after that, can finally exit the public health emergency and don't want to slide back to how things were in 2019. Yeah, you know, I think there's, and it's happening because one, the environment we're in currently is forcing it to happen. But overall, in in a healthcare environment, getting, we don't want to replace the on-site nurse or provider, right? We want to supplement, augment that, that team um, and, and we actually put our docs on their medical staffs to partner with them. I think the biggest thing that can continue to drive the expansion of telemedicine into facilities around our country is that understanding and that relational aspect between the current hospital staff and our staff and, and to realize that one, we're not, and this is one of the reasons I really enjoy what how Evolve goes to market, which is we're a B2B company. So we are supporting facility, health facilities, care facilities. We're not directly billing um, insurance companies for, for patient care. We're there to augment and support. And therefore, we're not taking revenue out of that stream. We're helping ensure that they can manage. And so when the facilities and the healthcare institutions realize that we're there to work with them, um, and I think that's happened quite a bit over the past several years. We continue to gain that trust in the grow. And I think that's what comes out of it is there has to be a trust. There has to be an understanding of how we partner in the fact that we're there to, to provide excellent care and we're not there to provide a competitive alternative to what is in the market today. So, so I think that helps health systems become more comfortable, doctors become more, and uh, clinicians become more comfortable so that we can grow together. Because I do think it's important. I mean, as we talked about earlier, clinicians continue to be uh, more and more scarce as a resource within our market. 
And so we provide that augmentation and that, that excess layer of care that helps offset shortages and keep health systems rolling and providing care at the level they need. No, and I think that certainly makes sense. You know, that point that you made of driving collaboration and partnership as opposed to replacement, I think is, is a very key one. Yeah, it is. And, and, you know, it's, to me, that's, what's exciting is I'm not there to take jobs or I'm there to actually help protect the patients and jobs by, by ensuring that we're covering and we're augmenting a great example. I had a meeting with a client and, um, you know, they did not have a, in a certain area within their hospital, they did not have a specialist who could provide this level of care. They ended up having to transfer the patient to 500 miles to another state and another facility to be able to see the, to seek the care needed. Um, that's highly expensive for the healthcare system. It's highly disruptive for the patient. You know, you pull the patient out of their home setting, their family is less accessible. You move them to another state where they seek care and then they have to get back. It's just, it's not the best alternative to have to do that. So if we can bridge that gap, keep people local, augment and support health systems and partner with them, I think everybody wins and benefits from that environment. Yeah, no, and I think that's a, a great message and, and also a great parting thought because unfortunately, believe it or not, we're already out of time. I want to thank my guest, Doug Duskin, for a great conversation today. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I'm a, God, time goes fast when you talk about something you're passionate about. But um, I'm excited to see and I believe that telehealth and telemedicine is gaining a lot of traction and will continue to shape the ecosystem that we all experience in healthcare delivery over the years to come. Yes, no, I agree with you. Pa- passion definitely makes time go by and, and makes the work rewarding. Uh, and thank you to everyone listening. Keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag HCDEJURE. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time. 